Chapter 8 of The Boy Scouts on Lost Trail by Thornton W. Burgess. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 Smuggler's Hollow. The lone wolves were on the trail shortly after sunrise the next morning. There was a hike of nearly twenty miles ahead of them if they were to make it to Smuggler's Hollow that day, and this they wanted to do if Spud's feet would stand it. He insisted that they were as good as ever and he dared Pat to set a pace that he couldn't follow. But Walter promptly nipped such foolishness in the bud. There is an old saying, and a true one, that a chain is no stronger than its weakest link. In the same way, the efficiency of a body of men on the march is in proportion to the number of disabled members who must be cared for. A wise leader at all times regards the welfare of his men, and jealously watches to see that they are as nearly fit as possible. Upton therefore gave orders that the pace should be an easy one, with frequent halts, believing that in this way the distance could be covered without serious inconvenience to Spud. As a matter of fact, the day of rest had put the sore feet in fairly good condition, with the heels fenced with cotton to prevent possible rubbing of the skin where the blisters had been, and with the broad roomy toes and soft leather of the moccasins, Spud experienced little discomfort and stoutly asserted that he could walk as far and as fast as anyone. The fateful boots dangled on the outside of his pack, for there was no room inside for them. At first he had insisted that he would fire the darn things into the pond. Afterward he offered to give them to whoever would carry them, declaring that they never would go on his feet again. Then Upton ordered him to carry them himself, saying that as he insisted on bringing them contrary to the advice of the others, he must take them through. Eight dollars, moaned Spud as he prepared to obey orders. Eight dollars for two blistered heels and four skinned toes. When I get home, I'll hang them on the wall of my room as a dreadful object lesson in pig-headedness. Oh, but I'd like to knock together the heads of the man who made those shoes and the one who sold them to Dad and told him that they were just what his little boy wanted. Well, weren't they? You seemed to think so when you got them, said Plimpton. They look to me like very good shoes. I didn't see anything the matter with them, remarked Hal. Oh, they're bully shoes. There's only one trouble with them. They were not made to wear, growled Spud. Wrong as usual, commented Walter. The shoes are all right. All they need is proper breaking in. But a twenty-mile tramp the first time is no way to do it. When they get shaped to your feet and limbered up, you'll find them bully for use in tramping in the country around home and I'll bet a year from now you'll be swearing by em as vigorously as you're growling at them now. Cut it out and fall in. Hal, your rear guard today. The trail lay along the edge of the pond. In fact, it was the same trail that Hal and Plimpton had taken to the cove after whales. Just beyond the cove it forked, one fork bearing to the east and the other continuing within sight of the pond and bearing to the north. The eastern trail was the one Pat had mentioned as leading to the lumber camp, and they stopped at the junction to see if they could find any traces of their unwelcome visitor of the day before. But the ground was hard and dry, so that it would take no imprint, so little time was wasted in looking for one. The incident was regarded as closed, and they pushed on along the trail to the north. It was a perfect early fall morning, clear, crisp, and invigorating. Through the trees they caught glimpses of Little Goose Pond, as clear as a mirror, not so much as a ripple marring its surface. Near the upper end, the trail suddenly emerged into a little opening, affording an unobstructed view of the pond. On the edge of this, Pat stopped abruptly and silently signaled the others to approach cautiously. Then, with a nod of his head, he drew their attention to the farther shore of a tiny cove which made in toward the trail at this point. Standing with her four feet in the water was a beautiful doe drinking and back of her and a little to one side, two fawns. It was a beautiful picture, an idealistic glimpse of wilderness home life. For a few minutes the five boys stood motionless, drinking in the full beauty of the wilderness scene. Then, slowly, steadily, Pat lifted his rifle. For a few seconds it was poised as steady as if held in a vice, with eyes wide with excitement and holding their breath, the four boys behind him waited for the report. Burn! It was not the expected crack of the rifle, but Pat's voice. Instantly the doe threw up her head, big ears forward, 
startled eyes scanning the shore and sensitive nostrils vainly trying to air for scent of danger. Then Pat took a step forward. The doe caught the movement, whirled, and with a sharp whistle bounded into the brush, the fawns following, the white flags of all three showing for a few jumps and then vanishing into the thick undergrowth. Oh, Pat, what did you do that for? Why didn't you shoot? A nice fellow you are, when you know we are short of meat. Pat grinned good-humoredly as he listened to the chorus of expostulations. Why didn't I shoot? In the first place, t'was a doe with fawns by her side, and Pat Malone is not one to make orphans of the innocent. Tis a poor sportsman that will kill a doe anyway, unless he needs to meet more than we do. In the second place, what would we have done with her if I had killed her? Tell me that. Why, we would have had meat enough to have lasted us for the rest of the trip, growled Spud. And would you have volunteered to carry a hundred pounds or more the better part of twenty miles? asked Pat. Oh, we could have cut out a few stakes and carried them without any trouble, protested Spud. And would you take the life of one of the most beautiful of God's creatures for the sake of a few bits of meat, and leave the rest to rot, doing no one any good? demanded Pat, a glint of indignation showing in his blue eyes. Sure tis all stomach and no heart at all, you have? Spud flushed slightly. I, I, I didn't think of it that way, he confessed. You're right, Pat. It would, well, I guess it would have been something like murder. I'll never forget that scene, but I guess if you'd shot the doe, I'd have wanted to, because later I have thought of those fawns. Say, fellows, Spud was very earnest, as he always was when thoroughly aroused. I've had the best lesson in sportsmanship I've ever had or ever expect to have, and I'll never forget it. I've never shot a deer, and I've always wanted to, and I've never been with any one before when there was a chance to shoot one. When I saw that doe, I was too excited to think of anything but the chance to kill, and if I'd been alone, I'd have shot. Perhaps I'd have been sorry afterward, and maybe I wouldn't, because if I had made a successful shot, I'd have been too tickled to think of anything else. But Pat has taught me the difference between a butcher and a sportsman. And when I get my first deer, it's going to be a buck, and a reward of an honest hunt, and not mere chance. The glint in Pat's eyes softened to a twinkle. The buck's waiting for you at Smuggler's Hollow this very minute, and tis Pat Malone will lead you to him, said he. Tell us, Pat. If that had been a mother lynx with two young, would you have shot? inquired Plimpton. As quick as I could have pulled the trigger, replied Pat with emphasis. How about the orphans in that case? asked Hal. I'd have done me best to put them out of mourning for the lost mother. But anyway, the varmints could have taken care of themselves. Bad cess to them, responded Pat. A she lynx be a devil and a mother of devils. And whenever was it a crime to give the devil his dues? A general laugh at Pat's vehemence followed as the lone wolves prepared to hit the trail again. But as they followed the lead of the big Irish lad, each of the others felt in his heart that the young woodsman had set an example in honorable conduct, mercy, and true sportsmanship that never would be forgotten, and that in later years would bear fruit. There were four better sportsmen for the incident at Little Goose Pond. The trail proved to be as blind as on the day when Spud was lost. At times in low places there was a perceptible path, but even there it would have been difficult for a novice to have said whether it was man-made or an old deer run. On higher ground it disappeared altogether, and the blazed trees were the only guide. Occasionally Pat would point out a comparatively fresh blaze as one he had made on his last trip that way. A halt was made beside a brook for rest and lunch. It was there that Spud further redeemed himself as a first-class scout. He had gone to a nearby spring for water. Hey, fellows, he shouted. A friend of yesterday's been along here. Here's a print of that patched moccasin. The others hurried for a look at Spud's find. There was no doubt about it. The print showed clearly in the soft earth by the spring. Pat scowled down at it thoroughly. T'was not from the Gillicuddy camp the varmint was coming then, he growled. "'Twas from the hollow. "'I wonder now what he was doing away off up here, "'and be there any more of his kind there now. "'Tis not likely that a man would be off here alone. "'It may be that we will find a hunting party at the hollow "'and that this fellow has gone off for supplies.' 
It was a disturbing thought and took the edge off the enjoyment of the lunch. Spud's feet were giving him no trouble, and so it was decided to push on faster than it had been planned. If the hollow was occupied, they would go on to another camping ground, of which Pat knew a couple of miles to the west. We'll do a little scouting when he reach the hollow and see how the land lies. If there's anybody there we don't like the looks of, we'll give him a wide berth without showing ourselves, announced Walter. I hope to goodness there isn't anybody there. The trail now lay along a hardwood ridge, all second growth, where Spud was given a chance to prove his marksmanship when they ran into a flock of grouse. An old cockbird flew to the top of a stump not ten yards distant, where with neck stretched and head turned slightly toward them, he stood as if carved from a part of the stump itself. The twenty-two cracked, and Spud sprang forward with a whoop of delight to pick up the fluttering prize. "'Now will you fellows make fun of my shooting?' he demanded as he held up the handsome bird in triumph. To his surprise, and to the surprise of the others as well, Pat shook his head in disapproval as he examined the bird. "'Twas no shot at all. Me baby brother could do as well,' he announced. "'For why did you shoot him through the body?' "'Well, where should I shoot him if not through the body?' demanded Spud indignantly. "'Didn't I kill him? What more do you want?' "'Sure you killed him. But twas just plain martyr. What chance did the poor bird have? And me having such great hopes of you, my boy. Pat spoke with such mournfulness that even the exasperated Spud was forced to smile. All right, Mr. Smarty, suppose you show me how to do it on the next one, he retorted. I will do that, replied Pat promptly, and threw forward his rifle. His keen eyes had noted one of the scattered covey running in the undergrowth, for the birds had not been frightened by the crack of the little twenty-two. Now as it paused in an open place some thirty-five yards away to look and listen, the big thirty-thirty rang out. The bird dropped, fluttered an instant, and lay still. Spud rushed forward to pick it up. It was headless. Pat grinned at Spud's expression. "'Tis the way we all kill the birds up here, and ye would be laughed out of camp did ye bring in one shot any other way unless ye took em on the wing, he explained. There be few in the woods with anything smaller than a rifle big enough for deer, and what would there be left but a bunch of feathers and one of these big bullets tearing through the body? Ye must learn to shoot the heads off before ye may qualify as a shot in the big woods. The birds are by way of being weak in their top knots anyway, and are most accommodating of sitting still. "'You wouldn't do that down in the lower country near the towns, Pat,' said Walter. "'And there's no weakness in their top knots either. "'There's no sitting for you there. "'They're about the quickest, smartest bird that flies, "'and it's a good man that can get three out of five with a shotgun. "'I suppose that shows the effect of environment on the habits of wild creatures. "'Up here grouse are seldom molested, "'because everybody is after bigger game, "'and so they have little fear of man and seem stupid.' Where they are much hunted, they are shy, quick to take wing, and sharp enough to take advantage of every bit of cover. Well, it looks now as if we shouldn't miss that bacon much. We've got six grouse and a rabbit, and that ought to keep us from starving for a day or so. Hal's big fish had furnished dinner the night before, and the game had been brought along to celebrate the making of camp in Smuggler's Hollow. A bit farther on, another covey of grouse was startled, and this time Spud really did distinguish himself. The first shot was a clean miss, but the bird did not take flight, giving Spud a second chance. This time he scored, and under the most trying conditions, for it was with all hands watching and ready to jolly him unmercifully if he failed. The trail now led through a heavy stand of young spruce, cut a burned-over lumber slash, dipped through a swamp where the boys sank above their ankles in black muck, followed by a broiling brook of a mile or more, then abruptly swung off at right angles over a hill, across a wooded valley, and then, for some distance, ran straight east along the foot of the hill on the other side. Walter was just about to remark that they seemed to be going in the wrong direction when Pat once more turned northward and headed straight for what appeared to be the highest part of the range of hills. "'Gee!' panted Spud. "'Have we got to climb that?' The trail climbed gradually, then suddenly dipped into a narrow pass or break in the hills, which from below had not been visible. "'Tis the entrance to Smuggler's Hollow,' 
announced Pat as they paused for breath. I suggest, Mr. Leader, that we leave our packs here and climb to the top of yonder hill. We can get a fair view of the hollow, and it may be that we can tell if any one be there. This suggestion met with the approval of all. The packs were cached under a low spreading hemlock off to one side of the trail, and free to their burdens, the boys made light work of climbing the hill. As Pat had promised, they were afforded an excellent view of the hollow. It was almost circular in shape, appeared to be wholly surrounded by mountains, and, to quote Hal, looked as if it had been made by a giant fist jammed down into the earth's surface while it was soft. There appeared to be no openings to it through the hills, though Pat assured them that he knew of two besides the pass below, and there might be more. In the middle was what had once been a clearing, but this was now overgrown with brush, which almost hid an old log cabin. Here and there could be caught the glimmer of a brook, and its course could be traced by the fringe of Adler's. Directly across the hollow rose the steep slopes of a mountain, heavily clothed with a splendid stand of spruce and pine, which gave to it a most somber and forbidding aspect. The declining sun picked out in vivid splashes of red and yellow a few early-turned maples and birches in the hollow itself and on the lower slopes of the mountains. Altogether it was as wild and lonely a scene as could well be imagined. For a few minutes the boy stood in silence in something very like awe, instinctively feeling that here brooded the very spirit of the wilderness. It was Pat who brought them back to the matter immediately in hand. There's where the smugglers put up their fight. And a grand fight it was, while it lasted, I'm told, said he. But I don't see any signs of smugglers or any one else. There's no smoke from the cabin. Shall we go down and investigate, Mr. Leader? I guess there's nothing else to do, replied Walter, and gave the order to return for the packs. Once more on the trail, it was but a matter of twenty minutes of brisk walking to bring them to the entrance to the hollow. It was decided that Pat should go on and scout around the cabin to see what he could discover, the others to remain where they were until he reported. In about three-quarters of an hour he returned. "'No one there,' said he. "'Though I'm thinking there has been within two days. "'For there be feathers of grouse scattered about, "'and the smell of smoke is still strong in the fireplace. "'It looks to me as if someone had been living there, "'but they're gone now, and we may as well move in.' This was in a way welcome news, though it would have been more welcome had Pat found no traces of recent occupancy. The packs were once more shouldered, and the lone wolves were soon in Smuggler's Hollow, and at the end of their day's march. The cabin was found to be habitable, but that was all. It was in a most dilapidated state. The roof at one end had fallen in, but over the four bunks it was whole and this promised reasonably dry sleeping if the weather should turn bad. There was no door, and the windows were but a memory, if indeed there ever had been any, but who wants doors and windows when camping? The floor was littered with dirt. The edges of the box bunks had been gnawed to splinters by porcupines, and there were evidences that the cabin was not unknown to other denizens of the woods. Walter issued orders briskly. Sister? You will clean out the cabin. Hal, you cut balsam for the bunks. Pat will get firewood, some good big logs, Pat. And Spud and I will hustle dinner. At once each sprang to his task with a will, and the camp presented a sense of cheerful activity. It is wonderful what a little cleaning will do in the most hopeless-looking place. When Plimpton had picked up the litter on the floor and swept it with a hemlock bough, and had filled the bunks with the fragrant balsam brought by Hal, the interior of the cabin seemed transformed. It needed only the snap and merry crackle of the leaping flames of the fire in the fireplace to dispel the last lingering sense of depression. There is no place so desolate that the dancing flames of a campfire will not bring to it something of cheer and comfort. Outside, Spud squatted beside a bed of glowing hardwood coals, Above these, each on a green wood spit, supported on forked sticks driven into the ground on either side of the fire, five grouse were roasting, while from a pot hook hung a kettle of steaming pea soup made from the herb worst. Spud was in his element, and his clear tenor voice was good to hear as he sang, 
alternately turning the spits to ensure an even roasting of the birds and keep the juices from running out. Occasionally he basted them with a piece of fat pork impaled on the end of a stick. It was a royal dinner that followed, and after this was out of the way, and the camp put in order for the night, the lone wolves gathered around a huge campfire while Plimpton graphically retold the tale of the taking of the smugglers on this very spot. When he had finished, they sat for some time gazing into the dancing flames and seeing there reenacted the stirring scenes the old cabin had witnessed when it was the stronghold of outlaws. When the flames had died down to glowing embers, Walter broke the spell with an abrupt order for all hands to turn in. "'Are you going to post a guard?' inquired Spud. "'I guess it isn't necessary,' laughed Walter. "'I hardly think we are likely to have visitors.'" End of chapter 8